Thank you very much, Simon, for that, that very kind introduction with um, more history than I care to remember. <laughs> um, I, I fear I would have been a disappointment to Jack Hill because Stein mentioned that after I graduated, I spent a couple of years uh, working for consulting companies in, in the UK. And immediately after graduation, I was determined to be a dam engineer. Uh, I thought that, that seemed the most exciting area to work in. And so I, I worked, uh, first of all, for Vinian Partners in, in London, who were probably the leading dam designers in the UK, and, and then uh, for another consultant, working on Kielder Dam in, in Northumberland, which actually impounds the, the largest man-made reservoir in Europe um, to get some, some site experience working on dam. Uh, unfortunately, uh, after I, I went back to Cambridge to, to uh, do research in some mechanics, I got distracted by other things and uh, got away from dams ever since. So I think um, Jack Hilf would not have approved. Um, so, um, I'm going to be talking today about um, uh, a different problem which is, is really very much occupying us at the moment, um, the, the design of, of very large laterally loaded piles. Um, and uh, if you like, this is, is very much at the applied end of, of my research that Stein mentioned that I have an interest in, in the theoretical side as well, but, but uh, this afternoon it's very much going to be at the applied end. So um, the motivation for this comes from uh, the development of offshore wind power around the UK. And whenever I talk on this subject, I like to spend a little bit of time on just the context of, of why we're interested in renewable energy um, and why, at least in the UK, we should look offshore for sources of renewable energy. Uh, but then what I want to do is, is link that through to the challenges that we have as geotechnical engineers, and that's going to, to lead to this issue of uh, the design of some very large diameter piles, particularly piles under lateral loading. And the, the project that I'm, I'm going to spend most of my, my time this afternoon talking about is, is a project called the, the PISA project, which was uh, completed uh, a couple of years ago, but it's, it's the, the writing up phase of that project is still in progress. Uh, and then at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of an indication of some of the future directions that we're going in this uh, particular topic. But, but first of all, um, why are we interested in, in this at all? Why renewable energy? Well, I think it, it's sort of pretty well understood these days that there are two uh, motivations for that. One is the appreciation of uh, climate change caused by our uh, profligate use of, of fossil fuels, uh, but there is another quite different issue, which, which is uh, diversifying our energy supply uh, to essentially make it more, more secure. And how, what are the various solutions uh, to that, those twin problems? And there are really, I think there are only three solutions. One is to use less energy, if we can, can uh, achieve something in the way of demand reduction. And the other two are either nuclear power um, or renewables, or probably both. Um, so uh, I've got nothing whatsoever against nuclear power. Uh, it seems a, a good idea to me. Uh, my personal interest happens to be in renewables, and that's why I'll, I'll be talking more about that uh, this afternoon. But uh, just to, to, to get our, our facts right about these issues, um, this is uh, the, the principal source of data relating to the whole issue of, of climate change. You may be familiar with this. It's probably uh, the most important graph in scientific history. Um, it's certainly, in my view, the most infamous graph in scientific history. It shows the increase of atmospheric CO2 over the last 50 or so years. Um, the, the monitoring uh, the, the uh, monitoring station in Hawaii, and you can see that when they started monitoring, the, the, the levels of atmospheric CO2 were about 320 uh, parts per million uh, by volume, and now it's over 400. 
And in fact, um, 2014 was the, the first monthly average over 400. For some reason, the, the, uh, we seem to be missing the very bottom of the slides here. Uh, it did flag up the fact the, yeah, I, can't keep, I just wonder if it might be worth making the the, um, the bar at the bottom of the picture disappear. One or two slides may get cut a little through. attention was just drawn to the fact that at the bottom of the, the slide, I, I noticed it was 2014 when there was a monthly average, and I think it was 2016, which was the first annual average that was uh, over uh, 400 parts per million. Um, now, as engineers, we maybe should be as worried, not by the absolute levels, but by the, the, the changes in uh, in uh, CO2. No, it's not wanting to change slides. Actually, both oil and gas production peaked in, in 2000, and now the production is down at about a third of that peak. And the reason that it's down at that level is essentially that the oil and gas in, in the North Sea and other areas of, of uh, UK waters is running out, and to be honest, we are quite literally scraping the bottom of the barrel for, for what is left there. Now, on a global scale, um, of course, a, there is a debate as to whether or not we have passed peak oil, and uh, the timescales are rather longer, but basically the same pattern is, is going to be uh, occurring. Probably we're not yet at peak oil, but we're not far off it. And on the timescale of a few decades, globally, we're going to be seeing this same sort of pattern, uh, that oil and gas, fortunately, is running out. Why do I say fortunately? Because I think that mankind is collectively stupid enough to burn it. If it, if it existed, we would burn it and we would uh, continue to damage the atmosphere. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, the fact that we're running out of oil and gas is, is a good thing. So we need to look for other sources of energy. And I would say I'm, I'm interested in, in the renewables. So in, in particular, interested in, in wind power as, as a source of power. So let's just start with where we are globally in terms of wind power. Uh, and you can see up there at the, the top, these are the top 10 nations 
for uh, wind power production. Uh, China is now the, the largest. That's fairly recent. They very big investment in wind power in China. Uh, the US, you can see the second. UK is down in, in uh, sixth position here, and uh, we account for about 3% of global wind power. Um, amongst these figures, I, I also include Denmark. Denmark doesn't appear in the top 10, but Denmark is a very small country, and on a per capita basis, actually, uh, Denmark is, is one of the leading users of, of wind power. So this is the total uh, wind power in um, each of these countries. But then if you break out from that the, the offshore capacity, you see a very different pattern. So uh, in fact, the UK, by a significant margin, is the biggest user of offshore wind power. We account for, for now 36%. A couple of years ago, when talking on this topic, um, actually we were able to boast that we were up more than 50% of the world's offshore wind power. But actually some other countries have, have caught up a bit since. Um, but we, we still account for more than a third of the world's installed offshore wind power. Uh, and you can see that, for instance, in the US, just the very beginnings of an offshore wind uh, industry. So, um, you can see this, this also accounts for about a third of our total wind, wind power. Offshore is extremely important to us. Let's just go into this in a, in a little bit more detail. Uh, I hope this is going to work. We can, we can look at a website and see what the actual um, current position as far as electricity generation in the UK is. I hope this is going to work. Yes, it does work. Okay. This is a very good website called Gridwatch, which tells you exactly what's happening in the UK right now as far as uh, power production is concerned. So uh, the UK demand at the moment is, if I can read that correctly, about 28 gigawatts. That's a bit below average. The, um, uh, the average uh, power demand in the UK is about 43 gigawatts, so we're at about two thirds of that. Um, you can see we're not getting anything from coal at the moment, we're getting about 20% from nuclear. Um, nothing from solar because of course it's the middle of the night in the UK at the moment. <laughs> solar doesn't work very well at night. Uh, wind is, is, this is unusually good, I have to confess. Um, wind is here at 33%, um, that's uh, unusually high, it's normally around about 20% or, or so. Uh, about the same coming from, uh, this is um, combined cycle gas turbines, um, and uh, somewhere along here we have, have nuclear, where yeah, nuclear 20%. So wind actually providing a bit more than, than nuclear. So if I can just go back to, yeah, the press on the power See what the, the, the pattern is. In fact, I, I um, this is the pattern in a, in a typical day. Uh, it says yesterday. Actually, I, I downloaded this about a week ago. So this is was the 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 mix of power sources that we had about a week ago. So wind here, you can see, is, is the green bit here. It was a fairly windy day. Typically, through the day, we were getting about 20 to 30 percent. It was quite a sunny day. So you can see we've got a bit of solar power in the middle of the day. Uh, along the bottom, the grey bit is the is uh, nuclear. Uh, nuclear power stations provide base load uh, power, so that's pretty well constant all the way through the day. Uh, the largest source for us at the moment is still combined cycle gas turbines, and then there are some smaller sources at the top. It's quite an interesting little one here. You might just be able to see this this little green sliver here. Uh, and these are some pump storage systems that we have in the UK, where when there's um, surplus power, you pump water uphill, and then when you need extra power, you let the water come downhill again. And, and effectively, that's used just to knock the peaks off uh, the, the main demand. 
from the largest peak each day occurs in the early evening, uh, essentially when everybody comes home from work and puts the kettle on and, and makes a cup of tea, etc. Uh, and that's what the, the um, front storage systems do. So what you can see is that the wind is now a pretty important component of our power mix. Uh, what I hope you can also see is that we could easily uh, double this amount that we get from wind. And what that would do would be offset the uh, combined cycle gas turbine generation. In other words, it would directly off offset our carbon use. And uh, that's the real motivation for, for this work. So why offshore wind? This is a, um, a map of, of the UK with the shading indicating the, the wind speed, average wind speed around the UK. The green is lower wind speeds. As you go through yellow and orange, you get to higher wind speeds. I think it's pretty obvious that the further you go from the coastline, the higher the velocities you get. And the higher the wind speed, the more use it is for wind power. It's a little bit more complicated than that. There's a second advantage of going further offshore in that the wind blows more steadily over water than it does over land, and so it's more suitable for power generation. So there's a very strong motivation to site uh, wind turbines further offshore, get the higher wind speed and the steadier winds. The disadvantage of going further offshore is mainly the fact that you then have longer cable lengths from, from the, the offshore site to, to the shore, and of course, typically the water gets deeper. The, on the right hand side, this is a, uh, a map of the bathymetry, the water depth. And what you can see is that, for instance, in the middle of the North Sea, in a region where there's quite high velocities, there's actually some quite shallow water. This is an area called the Dogger Bank. Uh, and so that's a very attractive area for developing for, for wind power, for the combination of, of high wind speed but actually not too deep water. So that's one of the target areas that we, we have for the future. So what sort of devices are we now putting out there? This is, is just a test installation of a seven megawatt turbine, uh, actually only about 50 meters from the shore. This is, is of Scotland. Um, it's a, a seven megawatt device. The diameter of the rotor is the, is the device is, is, is called a 171, that's the diameter of the rotor in meters. To make that a little bit more realistic, here's just the cartoon of the rotor. And the, uh, the quarter circle here is a full-size baseball pitch. So I, when, I, when I give a talk of this sort in different countries, I have to change the split. <laughs> So that's, that's a baseball pitch. Uh, that is an Airbus A380, the, the, the largest flying aircraft. It has tiny little wings compared to these things. Um, so these are massive, massive structures. Um, they're not very easy to move around on land. Here you can see we're trying to manoeuvre uh, one of the blades actually for this particular turbine uh, on land. Um, so these very, very big installations, not terribly suitable for, for onshore use, uh, much more suitable for offshore. Uh, seven megawatts is no longer the largest turbines. They're now installing eight megawatt uh, turbines. So fairly similar diameter, just a, a little bit bigger. But these are massive, massive structures. So getting a little bit closer to the, the geotechnical engineering, what are the, the problems that these structures pose for us? And when you analyze um, uh, an offshore wind turbine installation, you have to consider very many different load cases. The loads are uh, cyclic and, and repeated. Um, you have to consider when the, the turbine is in operation, when it's closed down during the storm, many, many different load cases. But in broad terms, <coughs> The sorts of loads that you get are of this sort of magnitude. The weight of the structure is about 10 meganeutons. In other words, the, the mass of the structure is, is around about 1,000 tons. Um, modern um, 
turbines may, may be a little bigger than that. The horizontal load that you get on the, the, the hub of the turbine is typically about two meganewtons, and actually offshore, the load that you get down at, at water level from uh, current and waves acting on the support structure tends to be larger in magnitude than the, than the load actually on, on the turbine itself. But the combination of those two loads is typically of the order of, of uh, something like six meganeutons. So the problem that we have is that actually a, a 1,000 ton structure is really quite a light structure but it has these massive horizontal loads. The horizontal loads are about, in, in this case, about 60% of the vertical load. And uh, uh, that's really quite unusual. In, in more conventional uh, type of applications, you come across horizontal loads, which are perhaps 10 or 15% of the, the vertical loads. So the problem that we have is essentially a very light structure subject to very large horizontal loads. And when it comes to designing the foundation of a structure like that, there are really two options that you can adopt. You could have a structure which just has one large foundation of some sort, and the overturning moment that comes from the, the net horizontal load on the structure, when you combine the wind and the wave loads, is, in terms of the, the, the load applied to the foundation, is a horizontal load and an overturning moment, which is carried directly by the foundation. The alternative is that you can have multiple foundations. So you can imagine that you have some sort of structure here, and you have, a, if you like, an upwind foundation and a downwind foundation. And the way that the overturning moment is carried is by push-pull action on the, the upwind and downwind foundation. So when you apply the load, the vertical load reduces on this side, it increases on that side. And the general philosophy is that as you get to deeper water and larger loads, that you have to go to this sort of form of foundation because you just can't make a structure big enough that can carry that moment directly. And that's what I'd like to explore a little bit more now. So this was the situation as far as design of different foundations for <coughs> offshore wind turbines um, in about 2014. And the main sort of structure of um, uh, this sort uh, are called uh, monopiles. They're just very large single steel piles. So here's, here's a picture of, of a monopile being manufactured. Here it's being installed you end up with a wind turbine sitting on the monopile below. This diagram on the right-hand side is quite a useful way of thinking of the sort of design space that we're working in. So on the horizontal axis is the, the power of the turbine, so bigger turbines as we come to the right, and on the vertical axis, the water, to, the water depth. So down at the bottom left-hand side, are relatively small turbines in shallow water. And then as we go up to the right, it's big turbines in deep water. And in about 2014, the structures that had been built on monopiles, just these single large uh, steel piles, were all down in this bottom left-hand corner. And the circles are the cases where the structure had to be uh, a more complicated structure, uh, typically a jacket structure, which if you like is, is like a miniature oil rig, a typical lattice work uh, structure that will, uh, will carry the, the wind turbine. The problem with the jacket structures is that each of these structures is much more expensive than the monopiles. Now eventually we might get to sufficiently deep water that we have to move to floating structures but at the moment, they're right in their infancy. That was the situation in, in 2014. If we just move forward now to 2017, the use of the monopiles, uh, these additional triangles, the yellow ones, are all the cases that were built between 2014 and 2017. And what you can see is that the monopiles have pushed right out into this area 
where we thought we were going to have to go to the more complicated, more expensive structures. So what's been going on? How have, have you managed to continue using monopiles, cheap monopiles, uh, for these more difficult structures, either bigger structures, and deeper walls? And the answer is that the monopiles have now reached sizes that um, have previously been thought to be um, not possible to achieve, and uh, the design methods have, have improved, and that's what I want to talk about now. So these things are absolutely massive. So here's uh, one of the monopiles for, for a recent um, installation. Here you can see the person standing next to it. The diameter across here is, is about eight meters. Um, the length of, of uh, this in the, in the seabed about 35 meters. Huge steel structures. Um, the wall thickness is about 80 to 100 millimeters. Um, really quite a complex design problem. Um, you can see the way they are manufactured is that you make a series of rings. In fact, here's some of the rings in the background here. And then they are welded together uh, on these seams. So each of these rings uh, can actually be a different thickness. And there is so much steel in a monopile that it's worth going to the detailed design that each of these can be actually designed at a different thickness to suit the precise soil conditions and the fatigue requirements on, on the structure. So the, the design of these structures is really getting quite sophisticated now. And what we want to do is make the, the, the designs as efficient as possible. So this led to uh, a major project that I was involved in, uh, which was called the, the PISA project. That stands for the um, uh, Pile Soil Analysis Project. And uh, it was a very complex, very large operation. Um, the sponsors are, are listed up here at the top. It was coordinated by uh, a company called Dong Energy, which is, is now called Ersted. There were several universities involved in delivering the research, um, assisted by various consultants and, and testing contractors. A very large, very complex collaborative project. So if I, this is the right time for me to acknowledge the other people who were involved in the project. Uh, in particular, the, the, the sponsors of the project. Uh, it was led essentially by the Carbon Trust, which is uh, an organization in the UK for promoting renewable energy um, techniques. Uh, technically, it was, was led by Dong Energy and a whole series of other companies that are involved in the offshore wind industry. And then the, the research was delivered by what was called the Academic Research Group, which involved three universities, uh, ourselves at Oxford, uh, Imperial College, and University College Dublin. And in particular, uh, I really must acknowledge the, the contribution of, of uh, my colleague Byron Byrne, who coordinated the, the whole project. So he, he led and uh, coordinated all the, the um, academic work. In the now, what were we trying to solve? Uh, what was the problem that we were trying to address with this project? Here's a, a cartoon of the way you design uh, uh, an offshore wind turbine. To a first approximation, you, you've got a fairly heavy turbine up at the top of a rather flexible steel column. And then the bottom of the, the column is supported by the monopile, which we idealize for design purposes using conventional design methods, uh, which are called PY methods, which no doubt quite a lot of you will come across. But you imagine a series of soil springs supporting the side of, of the monopile. And there are well-established methods used by the industry to, to uh, model the nonlinear behavior of the soil using what are called PY springs. And, and this is just the formulation of one of the curves that you can get from, from one of the standards. You get a standard uh, curve which tells you uh, what the resistance will be on the side of the pile. And that's how 
these large piles are, are currently designed. Now, on the right, here are a series of measurements that were made of the natural frequency of some real turbines that had been designed using these methods. And what is plotted here is the, the difference between the measured natural frequency of this structure and uh, what was expected. And it's found that typically they have a higher natural frequency than uh, was expected from the design. Now, Effectively, the, the whole of the bit above the ground is extremely well understood. You can't explain this discrepancy uh, from what's happening above ground. The only explanation that there can be is that the interpretation of how the ground is behaving uh, must be incorrect. And the higher natural frequency is indicative of a stiffer system. And so it must mean that the ground is actually stiffer than expected. Now, in fact, the, the natural frequency of these systems depends mainly on the structure above the ground. It's only weakly dependent on the stiffness below the ground. And the only way of explaining this 6 or 7% difference in the natural frequency between what's expected and what's measured is that the ground must be offering about three times the stiffness that uh, was expected. In other words, these curves seem to be underestimating the stiffness by a factor of about three. And if they're underestimating the stiffness, maybe they're also underestimating the strength. And so the motivation of all the companies to support this work was to try and get better estimates of the resistance from the ground in the hope that it would prove that the ground could actually offer higher stiffness and higher strength, and then you could get to more efficient design. So, how did we go about doing that? Um, slightly complicated story. The, the idea was essentially to base the new methods on a series of large diameter uh, pile tests. And uh, testing a, a, a monopile at full scale was prohibitively expensive. About the largest size that we could go to was about two meters diameter. So we tested a series of piles, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the, the detail of that, up to two meters diameter, uh, and used that, uh, used these field tests to validate a finite element analysis. So there was uh, a very carefully conducted finite element analysis of the field tests, which would be, were checked against each other until we were satisfied that the finite element analysis was a good representation of our field tests for piles up 